what is the flesh in our bodies right now? What is our flesh? What, then we're going to talk about how it became what it is today and where it came from and what's in, in store for our flesh. Amen. In Romans 8. You know, the Bible says, He who sows in the flesh, what? Reaps corruption. He who sows in the flesh reaps corruption. Praise be to God. People, sometimes people don't understand that. What we sow, in other words, what we speak, the things that we do, if we're doing things in the flesh. Now, who's the ruler of this world? Satan. The Bible says if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. So if you're doing things in the flesh, you're, you're sowing in the flesh because of the spiritual law which is sowing and reaping. That means you're going to reap corruption. You can't help but reap corruption. It's going to happen. Some of us are still reaping some of the things we've sowed already. That does not go away. Amen? Amen. But I'd rather reap it with Jesus where he can make a way than without him. Hallelujah. He makes a way. In Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is a representation of judgment. Who do not walk according to the flesh. So he says, if you're walking according to the flesh, you're going to get judged, aren't you? But walk according to the Spirit. That means being led by the Spirit of God. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the, the law was the representation of sin and death. Actually, you'll begin to understand that the Ten Commandments that were given in the Old Testament a representation of revealing sin because they didn't know what sin was. So unless you knew what sin was, you would sin, right? I mean, if you're driving down the road and there's no uh, speed limit, you just probably go about 80 or 90. And if you get pulled over and an officer says, well, you know, the speed limit's 40 here. And you realize you blew it. Amen? But unless somebody d didn't tell you about it, you wouldn't know, right? Hallelujah. Let's go on. In verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Now, what is He saying? That in the law, even though that there was the Ten Commandments, people couldn't obey them. <laughs> so they were doomed. They were, that's why they had sacrifices all the time of the blood, right? Okay, let's go on. That the righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the what? See, the Ten Commandments will actually be manifest in you when you walk according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Does everybody get that? So when you and I are out there using and drugging and doing all kinds of things, fornicating and whatever, our minds were always set on those things. Now all of a sudden there's a transition happening where our mind is beginning to set on the things of the Spirit because the Spirit is beginning to move in us. You can't do it on your own. You can't even pick up this Bible and read it without the Holy Ghost giving you the power to do it. You can't sit in this room tonight unless God has brought you here. Yeah. Hallelujah. And verse 6, this is important. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is what? Yeah. Death. In other words, you're going to die. But to be spiritually minded is <laughs> life and peace. You know, some people are tormented. They might not be do using drugs or alcohol, but they're tormented because they have no peace. There's a lot of people who go to 12-step programs and they're, they're, they're dry drunks. They're tormented still. They huff cigarettes like mad and drink coffee and sleep with one another. So they go to hell without using. Amen? In verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now you got to understand this. This means the fleshly mind. Your natural state mind hates the things of God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
But you are not in the flesh, but in the what? Spirit. spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if indeed the Spirit of God what? Dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now He's telling us something. Your mortal body is going to change because your body is a sinful nature. He said, but if you're led by the Spirit, your flesh is going to be crucified. <clears throat> Go to verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are what? Sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption for whom we cry out, Abba, Father, which means Daddy. Because you have a relationship. When the Spirit of God begins to manifest and bust through you, all of a sudden something begins to happen. You start calling Him Daddy. Because you, if you're led by the Spirit, you're known as a Son of God. If you're led by the flesh, you're on your way to death. Does everybody understand that? So we see here that present day right now, we see that those who are being led by the flesh, those are, who are actually being led by the flesh are under the authority of Satan. So this is the present state of man right now. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. Now you've got to understand something. You and I are made up of three parts. We're made up of a spirit, a soul, and a body. A spirit, a soul, and a body. Now your body is the outward, right? That's known as your flesh. Your soul is made of three parts also. The mind, the emotions, and the will. The mind, the emotions, and the will. Try to write this down so you know. The mind, the emotions, and the will. Now you're made up of what? Three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. So you have a spirit man. Now God is spirit, right? So you want to commune with God in your spirit. Now, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So those things need to be renewed, don't they? They need to be transformed. And your flesh, which is of the dust, needs to be crucified. In Galatians 5, 17, let's read this now. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. The things that you wish. Why? Because the flesh and the spirit are warring against one another. Does everybody understand that? The flesh does not want to do what the spirit wants to do. I feel an anointing in here. In verse 18. But if you are led... Let's read this together. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Keep going. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry. So, now, now, sorcery means drugs. Amen. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Hello? So let me tell you something. That's the works of the flesh, isn't it? So if you're practicing those things, you're not going to inherit or enter the kingdom of God. These are works of the flesh. This is what the flesh is, does. Present day flesh. How many of y'all know people living in the flesh? Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. And he, um, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, 
in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air. Now, who is the prince of the power of air? Satan. Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the loss of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So you and I were children of wrath. The wrath of what? The wrath of God. We are headed for the wrath of God. We are headed for eternal damnation. No in between. Amen? We see here that we are under the power of the prince. The word prince means originator. We are under the prince of the power of air. Did you ever notice that when you bite an apple, it turns brown? Everything's decaying, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that you were born to die? That's how not. Well, that's not what it was originally intended to be. <laughs> so everything that's coming in the world is going to die now because of what happened in the garden. Let's go to John six sixty three. So you and I are now born in darkness. Does everybody understand that? We're born in sin because of our flesh nature. Present day man, sin in his flesh. John 6 and verse 63. And I remember sometimes I'd be praying, I'd be, and I, I get a little foolish. And I'd start, man, I hate this flesh. Lord, I hate this flesh. <laughs> start slapping my arms. Ew, flesh, get out of here. <laughs> Die, flesh. Didn't realize beating my flesh wasn't going to do it. I had to be led by the Spirit to crucify it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus makes a profound statement here. It's powerful. In, in verse 63, and let's read this together. It is the Spirit who gives life. The pr flesh profits nothing. Your flesh and my flesh profit nothing. You know how many people are going to school and uh, they're getting all these rewards and all these trophies and all these certificates and they're going to come before the Lord and say, Lord, look at I did. And he says, I didn't see nothing. I don't mean poop. Unless it's for to bring glory to the Lord and expand His kingdom. Your purpose and my purpose when we become a child of God is to bring glory to His name and expand His kingdom. And to be willing to do whatever it takes and die to self because of what He's done for us and for who He is. Amen? So it says the Spirit gives life and our flesh profits nothing. Nothing. You know how many people go and work out six times a week pumping iron and jogging and Everything else, it didn't stop that demon of, of uh, cancer, did it? How you know, many people have been, man, I don't understand, man. People, I mean, I hear it all the time. This person all of a sudden just dropped dead. All of a sudden he's got cancer. All of a sudden this. Because you're not fighting flesh and blood. Flesh profits nothing. 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 Jesus says, your flesh and my flesh profit Nothing. Nothing. So when you and I are doing things in the flesh, it profits nothing. God doesn't even see what you and I do in the flesh. He's blinded to those things. He's looking to see what you do in the Spirit. If you don't minister in the Spirit, He doesn't see what you minister in the flesh. If you go talk to someone and share Jesus with them and it's not directed by the Lord, it's in the flesh and He doesn't even see it. Because He said, many are going to come to me saying, Lord, I did this and I did that. I cast out devils, I did this. You say, depart from me. I don't know who you are. You still practice lawlessness. You want to do things your way, but not mine. So our flesh profits nothing. Nothing at all. Hallelujah. Let's go to Romans 7. Is everybody all right? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't want to see a bunch of crosses up on the front lawn or nothing, okay? <laughs> That's it. I had it. I'm nailing my flesh. <laughs> You do me first and I'll do you next. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> In Romans 7, verse 5. Wow, this is a long, beautiful one. From verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to what? Death. Hmm. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the what? 
newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Whoa. In other words, you're not to serve the letter, you're to serve the spirit, aren't you? Because if you're serving the spirit, the letter will be manifest in you. In other words, the commandments and God's word. What shall we say then? Is uh, the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. In other words, he's saying if somebody didn't tell me about the law, then I wouldn't know there was sin there. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy and just and good. Has, has then what is good become dead to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Hello? Come on, listen to this. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So what's doing it? The sin that dwells in us. In verse 18, let's read this together. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I did not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now what's he talking about? Your flesh. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Yow. So our flesh is nothing. It serves no purpose. It profits nothing. It's nothing but walking sin. Does everybody understand that? Walking sin. Go to Matthew 26. Hallelujah. Matthew 26. So Paul's going, man, you know, I, I don't want to do these things, but I do them. I find that there's sin in my members. In my members. Now, your members are your eyes, your ears, the things that you hear. Your members are your mind, your will, your soul. Your emotions, these are your members. But we find that the sin in the flesh is affecting your soul, isn't it? Because it says it's contrary to the spirit. The spirit wants to do one thing, the flesh wants to do another, and the soul's in the middle. Which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Being tugged. Did you ever see the old cartoons with a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other going, you know? Uh-oh, which one do I listen to? <laughs> well, praise God, we have a choice, don't we? But through the Holy Spirit and power, you'll make the right choice. 
Only through the power of God can you make the right choice. Psalm 26 and verse 38. I mean, uh, Matthew 26, sorry. Matthew 26. Is everybody there? And verse 38. Let's read it together. Then he, Jesus, said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now, Jesus was praying. Does everybody understand? He had three disciples with him. And he went a little farther. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is what? Willing. Willing. But the what? Flesh. The flesh is weak. What's it weak to? Sin. The ways of Satan. It's weak. It has no power. It served the devil for all of these years. We were born in sin. Your flesh profits nothing. This flesh that you carry around. Or the flesh that carries you around. Now, let's go to the beginning on how this came about. Amen? Are you ready? To God be the glory. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. I guess if you're going to go to the beginning, let's go to the beginning. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. Put a guard over my members, O oh Lord. Crucify my flesh. Kill me quickly. <laughs> all those desires. All those thoughts. All those emotions. Go in Jesus' name. And renew in the Spirit. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning God created what? The heavens and the earth. So what was created first? The heavens. The spiritual realm, right? The spirit, the spiritual realm. The heavens were created first. Amen? Now, you know, we've, we've gone through this already and we shared about how the original earth was perfect because God created original earth. Amen? Um, and we stated that the sons of God, known as angels, were inhabiting the earth in the original state before man was created. In fact, go to Job 1. So we can verify this. Job 1. That's the employment section in the Bible. It says Job 1. I remember when I first got the Bible, I said, man, look at this. Praise God, they got employment in here. And somebody told me it was Job. I said, man, I thought that's how you spell Job. What do you mean? How about the Psalms? I heard that on your tape today. Psalms. And I used to say Psalms instead of Psalms. I still say some strange things. But praise God. Paul said, I didn't come with great speech, but I came with the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. In Job 1, in verse 6, let's read this together. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now who came? The sons of God. Those are known as angels. Okay, and Satan was known as an angel also. But he's called Satan here, but you'll find out he used, didn't used to be called Satan. Amen. So we see that the heavens were made first and the heavenly host. Go to Psalm 148, verse 1 through 6. It says what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts, which is like armies. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him all you stars of light. Praise Him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. So He commanded and, he, and he, they were created. Well, you know, He spoke and He said, that, that's it, there they are. So we see that the heavenly hosts, the angels, are known as sons of God. They inhabited the original earth. 
And we know about Lucifer, and we'll talk about him here in a second. Now, let's while we're in Genesis, well, while let's go back to Genesis. I want to go a little bit further. We see that God created heavenly hosts, right? He created the angels. He commanded and they were created. Let's go back to Genesis 1.26. Now God creates the earth and He begins to inhabit the universe with plants and suns and the moon and the universe and all the other things. He, he did that, right? In verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we see that he's creating Adam to have dominion over everything. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Now remember, when Adam was originally created, he was in the image and likeness of God. In Adam was male and female. Does everybody get that? Because out of the rib came Eve. So Adam was created in the likeness and image of God because God is male-female, isn't he? He's no respecter of person. So Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. He was. In verse 28, Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, which was the blessing, wasn't it? Fill the earth and subdue it. He said, man, you got dominion over it. Fill the earth, you and the woman. Fill the earth. Take paradise and expand paradise. I've given you this. I've given you everything. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish over the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In fact, we know that the Lord brought the animals to Adam, and Adam named them. So when he went to the, wanted to go, um, you know, skiing in the water or whatever, he just called Moby Dick, and he got on and went surfing or whatever, right? I mean, he had dominion, didn't he? He talked. He had fellowship with the animals. Does everybody understand that? Because there was no division. They were one in the Spirit. So God created man and blessed him in his image and in his likeness, didn't he? Let's go down to Genesis 3. In verse 1, Now the serpent was the most cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said that you shall not eat of the tree of the garden, of every tree of the garden? Now we know that the Lord told Adam and Eve not that they couldn't eat of every tree of the garden, right? Well, just to verify this, let's back up a little bit. Um, in verse 16 in Genesis 2. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. Then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall what? You're going to die. Okay. Now we find out that the serpent was there at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, wasn't he? Now we know that the serpent was tempting Eve to eat of the tree, wasn't he? He wanted her to eat of it. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you what? Touch it, lest you die. Okay. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall... You will not surely die. So God calls him a... I mean, the serpent called what? God a liar, didn't he? For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, of course, the serpent's got a lot of promises, doesn't he? He makes a lot of promises to us out there. I remember getting high, we used to hear a lot of promises. We'd be getting buzzed, drinking, and partying. Yeah, we'd have all kinds of good swelling words. Man, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Yeah, you're going to do this and we're going to make all kinds of money. The next morning we didn't, we woke up and we didn't have two nickels to rub together. Oh, we heard a lot of voice for the serpent, man. He gave us a lot of promises. So when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, verse 6, that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So the serpent deceived Eve and then she gave it to her husband. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. 
and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Why did they sew fig leaves and make themselves coverings? Because they were already covered with the glory of God. They had a glorified body. They weren't, they didn't have a conscience. They were, didn't have fear. They didn't have um, worry. They didn't have shame. They didn't have guilt. They didn't have any of that stuff. Their spirit, their soul, and their body were one. So everybody understand it. The Bible says a house divided cannot stand. And the serpent want to divide their house. If he could divide their house, they would fall. God created Adam and Eve to live eternally. Not to die. Amen? So they had a glorified body. They were perfect. They knew no sin until the serpent convinced them and conned them. Adam was the ruler of the world. And then the serpent took his office. Does everybody get it? Now that's why the world is under the rule of the serpent. Except for when you come to Jesus. Now, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool day. Now you've got to understand something. If God was fellowshipping with you face to face in this kind of glory, your flesh couldn't stand it today. So they had to have glorified bodies. Does everybody understand it? And I'm going to show you that they didn't have blood in their bodies either. To God be the glory. Because a glorified body doesn't need blood. Hallelujah. Watch this. So they sowed the fig leaves, right? Because they committed sin. Trying to cover their own sin. Didn't we all have a tendency to justify our own sin? Yeah, well, she made me do it. And they hid in the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? And, and so he said, Here, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that? You were naked. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman, she made me do it. The woman whom you gave to me, with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. It sounds like, you know, evil's already happened. And I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go. So we know that the serpent was upright. Amen? The serpent was upright. Because now he says you must go on your belly. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. And what are we made of? Amen? And I will put enmity, which means hatred, between you and the woman. And between your seed and what? Her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. So we know that she was going to have more than one child. Is everybody with me? And that her, and this was going to be a, a different way than what God had planned for conception. And in pain you shall bring forth children and your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now everything changed. This was judgment put on Adam and Eve. Does everybody understand that? Because why? Because they had obeyed the devil. The serpent. Alright. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of. Curse is the ground for your sake and in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field, and in sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So in other words, you're going to have to labor from this day forth. No more picking fruit and eating. I'm going to supply you. Now you're going to have to do it your own. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now you got to understand something. Because we have this fallen nature, your dust, your flesh wants to return to the dust. Why? It's cursed. And we'll get more to it. And Adam called his wife name Eve because she was the mother of what? All living. So your mother and my mother is Eve. 
That's where it all started from. Does everybody get it? Then the, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and what? Clothed them. Now I want you to understand something. In the garden, in the garden, uh, Adam and Eve to have a glorified body, right? Not a sinful nature. The serpent is there. Okay. He's got, he's sin, he's the originator, he's known as the prince of power of air and so forth, right? He's got his fruit, his tree there, that he's trying to push them to sin. He knows if Adam and Eve sin, he can answer them. Alright? And then he knows that they will die. Now you gotta remember something. Satan hates man. He hates the creation of man. Now, I'm gonna show something. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. You're saying, what does this gotta do with the flesh? I'm going to show you. <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? In verse 39. First Corinthians 15, verse 39. Let's read this together. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So we see that there's heavenly bodies and there's earthly bodies. There is different flesh, isn't there? Now, in the Garden of Eden, when God created man and Adam and Eve, man, their flesh was glorified flesh. Does everybody understand that? It was not of blood like what you and I are accustomed to. The animals are different. They were like what we are now. Does everybody understand that? Having blood. Okay. Because at the at that period of time, animals do not have a spirit. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Man has a spirit. And the life of the flesh was in the spirit of the man. Your, the life, the glorified body was supplied by the spirit. The animal was supplied by the blood. Does everybody understand that? I guess I better go a little bit further here. Go to Levit Leviticus 7, 17. Leviticus 17. Hallelujah. Leviticus 17. Is everybody all right? <coughs> Hallelujah. We'll go a little bit further in this too. In verse 11, let's read this together. <coughs> Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the souls, or what it calls covering. So what did the Lord do in Genesis? He says he took an animal. God took the animal and killed it because it was blood. Does everybody understand that? And he covered Adam and Eve with the garments of the skin of the blood. And then he sent them out. Because the blood made reconciliation for the life. In other words, they they were judged and, and the things that they had done, they were cursed for, but God still restored the blessing of multiplication. Does everybody understand that? To subdue, to multiply. 
and fulfill his will. He still had a purpose. So God in the garden killed an animal because the life of the flesh was in the animal because their, because of their sin, their glorified body changed. And now their flesh was not the flesh of a glorified body. It was the flesh of a fallen nature. And it had to be supplied by blood. So now we understand, right? Now let's just recap on this quickly. So when Adam and Eve, when their eyes were open, their eyes were really shut to the spirit realm because they used to talk to God face to face, right? And when their eyes were open, they actually put on flesh. They actually put on the fallen nature of flesh, didn't they? And so now the life of their flesh was in the blood because at one time the life of their flesh was in the spirit because they had a glorified body. And I'll explain this a little bit more as we get a little bit deeper here. So what did they actually do? They put on... Remember we read that um, in Genesis that he, the Lord said, in your seed and her seed there would be enmity, hatred. So he knew that there were going to be a seed. Seeds, didn't he? So what your nature and, and what your flesh and what my flesh are right now is a character of Satan's... <coughs> his character. The character of Satan. That's why now you're not... Because his character was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because the world walks under good and evil, don't they? But when you're under Christ, you walk under righteousness. You walk under truth, don't you? You walk in the Spirit. So there's a difference. So we see now Adam and Eve actually became, their flesh was almost not like the flesh in a, of an animal, but similar, wasn't it? Because the, the life of the flesh was in the blood, not in the Spirit anymore. So what did the Lord do? He sacrificed an animal for them so He could send them out with the blessings still. But they would still have to reap what they sowed. Do you understand that? They still had to reap what they sowed, didn't they? Okay, let's go a little bit uh, just, just, just to show something here. I'm going to go to uh, Ezekiel 28. We better back up a little bit. Ezekiel 28. Hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter 28 and uh, verse 11. Ezekiel 28 verse 11. We're talking about Lucifer here. Okay? Because I want to go back. Remember the angels were created, right? The heavenly host and the original earth. And we've gone over this before, but just to recap on this. Um, in verse 12, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take a lamentation up for the king of Tyra and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. And we know that the king of Tyra was a representation of Lucifer. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in the garden of God. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, brill, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, and turquoise, and emerald with gold. So we know all of these stones were on Lucifer, weren't they? Representing where they came from, the, the earth. So that means he was ruler of the earth. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were what? Created. So he was a worship leader, he was a praise and worship leader of the universe. The earth was known as the mountain of God. That's why you notice how music affects people. I mean, people will worship Satan by all that music, won't they? I mean, you don't go to bars now and hear people worshiping God. They worship Satan because the music affects them. Why? Because it originated right with Lucifer. He was a praise and worship leader. Look at all these rock stars and so forth. Man, you talk to a lot of them. They're bugged. They tell you that they can't even stop playing because they're tormented. They only get peace when they play. Hallelujah. In verse 14, You are the anointed cherub, which means what? Archangel. Who covers, I establish you, 
you were on the holy mountain of God, you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones with the holy mountain of God, the earth. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now here's Lucifer, the praise and worship leader of the earth. The sons of God inhabited the earth, right? Okay, let's go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Hallelujah. 14. Isaiah 14. Man, we could start a choir of coughing tonight. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Let's read this together. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now what's Lucifer mean? Bright and morning star. Do you notice that he was called Lucifer when he was right with God and his name changed afterwards? In fact, he put on a different cloak too, didn't he? He became a serpent. <laughs> instead of this glorious, beautiful angel. You see what sin happened? He sinned, didn't he? Sin originated right here. Watch. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, now listen, this is what your flesh is. I will ascend into the heavens, I. I will exalt my throne, I, above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, I, on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And the Lord says, Yet you shall be brought down to, Sh to Sheol, which means hell, to the lowest depths of the pit. So what did Lucifer do? He exalted himself, didn't he? Here he was, a beautiful angel. Exalted himself above God, was a praise and worship leader. Right? The Lord threw him out, closed down the earth, which became the chaotic earth, and then when he restored it is when he created Adam. And he created the animals and so forth. Now, go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Here's what your flesh is. Fallen nature. I. I, yai, 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 yai. Demonic pizza. <laughs> Revelation 12. <laughs> Praise be to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 12. In verse, uh, verse 9. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast with him. So we see his name got changed, didn't he? Hallelujah. And it says, and his angels were, that were with him. Now I want to show you what his angels that are with him, with him are. Go to Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12 Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. What does it say? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Those are the angels that were with him. Okay? Oh, those aren't demons. Those were the angels. Hallelujah. Now, listen. When 
Adam and Eve fell and their flesh body, they, they lost their glorified body, that was taken over by the character of Satan. Does everybody understand that? Your flesh and my flesh is a character of Satan. L look at the, when, when this happened, death separated them from God, didn't it? They no longer had that fellowship with the Lord like they used to, did they? They were, cur they were cursed with labor. Their eyes were closed to the spirit realm and open to the carnal realm. They lost the office to Satan. They became children of a rejected flesh of sin. <laughs> Does everybody get it? Is everybody with me? They lost their soul. And their house was divided. Why? Because their spirit, soul, and body were no longer one. They were at, at first had the mind of Christ and so forth. Now when Satan entered, because their house was divided, they knew conscience, they knew evil, they knew good and evil, didn't they? But it wasn't directed by God at that time because God was going to train them up their way. They already were born to have an eternal life. Now they brought death because of their disobedience. Sinful nature, no longer dwell with God. Lost glorified body. But the Lord made a way to restore the blessing by the blood. Does everybody understand that? Now, this is why we always cry out, I, 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 I want, I want, I need, I need, I, 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 I. Because that's exactly what Satan did. Does everybody understand that? Your flesh is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because it's of the dust, because it was created, it wants dust. It wants to return to the dust and serve dust. That's why you're in a pool, aren't you? You're like in that pool. Pool wanting to go back to the fleshly ways. Why don't I go back and serving the flesh? You know, your flesh cries out, feed me. Right? Your soul cries out, woe is me. And your spirit cries out, what? Let me. <clears throat> Remember, flesh is a character of Satan. Wanting, selfish, greedy, boastful. Wanting glory, vengeance, covets. Wants recognition. It wants. It wants. You know, Satan uses our flesh to send impressions to our soul. Doesn't he? Does everybody get it? The Bible says that he shoots darts. What does it hit? It's your flesh, doesn't it? Your mind changes, doesn't it? I mean, you got to remember something that your flesh is the outwardness here, isn't it? When you smell something, doesn't it change your mind? When somebody says something, doesn't it change your mind? When you feel something, and doesn't the devil remind you? Doesn't even your mind bring your emotions or, or cause a feeling in your flesh? Or Does everybody understand that? In other words, you could go through and see an old picture of somebody and bring back something. The devil will try and shoot a dart at you and remind you of your past and he'll bring back something. He'll try and put guilt on you. He'll try and do everything he can. Why? Because his character, his nature is your flesh. <clears throat> so now when you come to the Lord, you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that you were born with. But when you come to the Lord, you have now the tree of life to where you can eat, life, eat from the tree of life. You always will eat something, won't you? You'll either feed your flesh or feed the spirit. Hallelujah. Now, let's go a little bit further. Uh, let's go to uh, Luke 24. I, I want to share with you just a little bit of to bring understanding about the glorified body. I want to share with you that Adam and Eve were created with a glorified body, right? In Luke 24, the flesh profits nothing. You know, I uh, you realize that even a child, because it's born with that fallen nature, wants, wants, wants. I, I, I. But doesn't get what it wants of Christ. <laughs> Amen? And then as we get older, we get worse. <laughs> 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 
want recognition of their flesh. <laughs> in Luke 24 and verse 36. And as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, now Jesus rose from the dead, and he said, peace to you. Now he appeared to them. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now this is Jesus. Okay, he rose from the dead and he appeared to them, didn't he? And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that is, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have what? Flesh and bones as you see I have. So he says, I had flesh, flesh and bones. He didn't have blood, did he? He had flesh and bones. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marvel. Wait, what did I say? But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food? So now he's really going to blow their minds. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honey, and he took it and ate in their presence. So Jesus showed up with a glorified body, didn't he? He had no blood. What was he doing? It was the original state of Adam and Eve. Does everybody understand that? There was no blood. Let's go a little further. In Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Hallelujah. In Matthew 22 and verse 30. Matthew 22, verse 30. Is everybody there? Okay, let's read it. For in, the, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So in the resurrection, in other words, when you're brought up again, you're like angels, aren't you? In other words, like Jesus in a glorified body. Does everybody get it? No blood in a glorified body but life in the Spirit. Amen? And 1 Corinthians 15. Hallelujah. So when Jesus came the first time, He came to restore our soul, didn't He? And when He comes the second time, He's coming to restore our body. Glory. 1 Corinthians 15. The flesh profits nothing. And verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Hallelujah. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Now understand this. If flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, that means Adam and Eve were walking in the kingdom of God. They did not have blood. Amen. Now you and I, our flesh and our blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We can't enter that realm with this body. Okay? Verse 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. Changed. What? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. What's he talking about? The flesh. And this mortal must put on immortality. The flesh. Does everybody get it? So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to the pass the saying that it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And Daniel 10, and verse 7. Uh, let's go to verse 5, I'm sorry. 10.5. Now here's Daniel, he's been praying and fasting. And, and he says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Yaphaz. His body was like grail, his face was like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, and his arms and feet like 
burnished bronze in color and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. That was the Lord. Okay? He saw a vision of them all. Right? And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me. For my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. In other words, even though he was in the vision, the Lord showed up in this vision. But to him it was a vision, wasn't it? But God's presence wiped him out. Suddenly a hand touched me and made me tremble on my knees in the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have not for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel. Let me tell you, when angels of the Lord show up, they always say, Don't fear, because their presence will wipe you out. I mean, you remember they, the, the, the disciples were all afraid thinking it was a spirit, right? When they saw Jesus. <clears throat> and he said, From the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, and behold, Michael, who is the archangel, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now understand something. I just use this as a reference because Daniel had flesh like mine and yours. When he had the vision of the Lord and the angels showed up, he couldn't take it, could he? Now how would... if if Adam and Eve had the flesh like ours, they wouldn't be able to handle it in the garden, would they? They had to have glorified bodies, and they could not have been with blood. In Revelation 22, in verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, this sounds like almost back in the garden, doesn't it? Because Adam and Eve were eating of the tree of life, weren't they? They were eating of the tree of life to sustain life. You and I will be eating these fruits to maintain. So we understand that. This will be our food. We'll be eating these fruits to maintain. Um, and there shall be no more curse. The curse shall be removed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no light there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And we know that that's for us, isn't it? Which is to come. So I want you to understand it was a, like the Garden of Eden was almost like a prototype of what, how it was going to be in, in the new heaven and the new earth, wasn't it? Because in its, in its original state, it was like this. In its original state, the earth was perfect and beautiful. The sons of God were inhabiting it, the angels. And then when Lucifer rebelled and the Lord removed them from the, the earth, and he shut down the earth, and, and it was the chaotic earth, and then God restored the earth, and he created man. So you got to understand that Lucifer, who became Satan, hates man because God replaced him. Everybody get it? God replaced Lucifer. He replaced what he did. Amen? So Lucifer hates us. Now, um, so we know that Jesus came the first time to restore our soul, and the second coming is known as the rapture, to restore our bodies. Alright? Turn to Romans 8. I want to share this with you. Just quickly. Romans chapter 8.
Is everybody there? Um, in verse 22, 22 and 23. Let's read it together. Not only that, or, wait a minute. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our what? Our body. See, we're waiting. We eagerly groan. We are waiting for the redemption of our own body. Amen? First John chapter 2. Verse 15. The Bible says what? Let's read it together. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So it's important that we do the will of God, right? Let's go to Philippians 3, verse 7. This is Paul saying, but th what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Hallelujah. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And to be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul is saying, man, everything I've learned, everything of my past, I count it all rubbish compared to what I know now in Christ. The flesh profits nothing. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You ready? I mean, come on. Not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty, according to the flesh, according to the ways of the world, are called. Now listen. Verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became who became for us, what? Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Hallelujah. Now the Bible tells us that you'll know them by their fruit, won't they? You're going to find out your own fruit. You're going to find out whether you're still walking in the flesh. Whether the flesh is still hindering you. You'll know by your own fruit of where you're at. What's the best thing to do? Get in the Spirit. Do whatever it takes. It's not about a feeling. Hello? It's not about what you see. It's not about what you think. It's not about anything in this world. It's about the things of the Spirit. Does everybody get it? It's about the things of the Spirit. You know, when it's time to worship, worship. Worship God. Don't let anything hinder you. Don't let your mind hinder you. Who gives a hoot? Amen? When we were out there acting like idiots, begging for money for dope, we didn't care what people thought. We didn't care who we were with. Whatever. Prostituting ourselves and all kinds of other stuff that we were doing out there. We didn't give a hoot. As long as our flesh got fed. Or those demons got fed, huh? <laughs> So don't give a hoot anymore. Get foolish for Christ. Because He's rescued every single one of us. 
The only way you're going to take dominion over your flesh, because your flesh is of a fallen nature, is if your spirit man is stronger. Your soul must be renewed. The Bible tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's what the Word does. And the Spirit brings you understanding. So you get in the Spirit as quick as you can every day. Those deliverance prayers, those daily confession. Um, you got to hit those, man. When you're being troubled, you pull them out and you hit them. So you can crucify that flesh. You can take dominion. You can't fight. Believe me, I used to go in prayer and beat my flesh. Man, get down. It didn't work. Just got up more. I was a baby and foolish. Amen? But now, praise God. Be careful what you speak. Be careful what you hear. Be careful of the things. Why? Because you don't want to feed your flesh. You want to starve your flesh. You want to starve it. So you can take dominion over it. You know, if you put food out for an a, a cat, that cat will come and all of its buddies. If you don't put the food out no more, it will finally leave. You know, we pick spirits up. If you feed it, those spirits get fed by your emotions. Those spirits get fed. If the devil can arouse your flesh up for you to feed what you feel and so forth in your flesh, he can access a demon to you. And we wonder why we get troubled. We wonder why we worry, frightened, all these other things that happen. We wonder why we begin to act the way we shouldn't act down the road. We tell by our own fruits. We wonder why we can't be submissive. Because the Spirit's there. Amen? Because if you're truly Christ's child, you're dead to your ways. If Jesus Christ is truly your Lord, and you said, take my life, I give it to you, then don't take it back. Because he paid the price for me and you that our flesh could be crucified with his flesh. But if you're going to be led by your flesh, your flesh is alive. And the wages of your flesh is death. So let's be led by the Spirit which crucifies our flesh. We must be willing to do whatever it takes every day. That's why the Lord says, deny yourself. You know what he's saying? Deny your flesh. Deny your flesh and then you can pick up the cross. If you don't deny your flesh, you're going to pick up the cross of Satan. His way. And he's going to crucify you his way. Amen? Amen. And I'd rather be crucified with Christ. And to God be the glory. And everybody said... Amen.